Well, Peter Turk Ace's intensely personal memoir, The Echo of a Noise, is on at Monte Casino Theatre from April 21st until May 14th. It is the journey of one of South Africa's national theatre treasures who learned to use humour as a weapon of mass destruction. He, destruction, rather. He joins us now in the studio to discuss this further and to tell us more about politics when he was growing up. Peter, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for joining us in our studios. You're sporting your black beanie as well. My black beanie. <laughs> I feel so honoured. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it's incredible. You know, you started out in the 70s and now you've had almost or over 7,000 appearances on stage. I want to ask about longevity, but I also want to ask, does it feel just as exciting? Every performance is the first one and the last one because of the audience. <laughs> yes. The audience makes it live and every audience gives me a new energy. Mm. So you can never say it's the same performance, it's the same thing every time, it's different every time. Yeah. Yes, of course it's exciting. It's a bit terrifying yes. when you suddenly, like with my present show, I'm sitting on stage for 90 minutes telling you a story. Yeah. And that's not usual in a theatre. Usually you've got things happening. Mm. You've got all sorts of exciting things. Blah, 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 and that's a different type of theatre. But it's wonderful to have a chance to just chat and tell a story with an audience about us and about life and love and laughter. And laughter is needed a lot now, especially in the world. Yes. So Those themes, though, are, are, are incredible. When you were writing... Uh, the echo of a noise. What was happening in your life at the time? I'm curious about that. It was in uh, 2015. I was turning 70, yeah. okay, and the Grahamstown Festival said, let's celebrate. And I said, no, that's fine. So I put in a new play at the festival and then three one-man one shows as a sort of a celebration. Yeah. I mean, I was doing the work, you know, um, <laughs> and I did an Evita show. Then the next day I did a Bambi Kellerman, who is her sister, <laughs> who's a stripper from Germany, <laughs> so she's fun. And then I did um, The Echo of a Noise, which I thought I'd put together for one performance. Stories of my life growing up in a musical family with my parents in Cape Town, my best friend being our coloured maid, mm. Sunny Abada, who really taught me so much and so much humour and so much love. Yeah. Um, and that was in the 50s and in the 60s. And then joining the Space Theatre, in Cape Town, coming to join the market theatre in, the in the times when it was illegal mm. to actually talk to people who were not white and to be just, you know the story. Yes. It's a, it's, um, anyway, it was for one night only, and when it was over, everybody said, wait, 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 you've got to do it again. You've got to extend this. What about that? What happened then and then? And what about Sophia Loren, whom is my best friend? <laughs> and I love her. So that's where it started, and it has developed and grown, and the, the one I'm doing now is all of, also very much anchored in where we are today in, in this country. I was having a conversation uh, just a couple of weeks ago with, with Dr. Ghani and uh, you know I was very curious we were talking about Gunene and the King and so much of the audience's uh, response and reception of the contents of the play uh, somehow magically forms part of what the play was always intended to be and I wonder if you've had a similar sort of experience you know audience members sort of coming to you and saying my goodness I know it's your story but sheesh it's had such an impact even for me it's a fantastic to hear that from you because it's exactly what I even got yesterday after the performance wow. I go into the foyer after the show I say let's do a selfie <laughs> which is <laughs> yes, a great way yes, to also yes. spread the word yeah and two people came to me and they said you know I don't know you really I, I'm from a different country I went through the same pain, I went through the same happiness, I went through so much which was obviously not part of what you were telling me, mm. but everything that I got from your story was my story as well. Mm. And yes, I want that. Each of us has a different story. Each of us has a different definition of what humor is. Mm. And I see a great difference between comedy and humor. Comedy is a joke, which is great. Mm. But humor is very personal, it's like a fingerprint. Everybody has a sense of humor, not because it's funny, but because they can laugh at their fear. Right. And very often I find in my work today in South Africa, the things that I entertain my audience with are things they don't want to think about. Mm. You know, what's going to happen in, with the election next year? What's going to happen with this? Vladimir Putin, what's going to happen to him? Well, it's very simple. He can pretend to be Evita Besaidna's husband and then nobody <laughs> will arrest him. You know? could. <laughs> so, so we can find ways of bringing the humor into something that is uncomfortable. And so much of my life was very strange. My mother was from Berlin mm. uh, just before the war, the Second World War. She, escaped, uh, she came to South Africa, married my dad, also a pianist. They met on the stage of the City Hall playing a Mozart 
double concerto. And I only found out after she was dead that she was a Jew. Oh. I mean, what are we talking about here? You mean I grew up in a family where nobody actually said, including her, right. why? I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. But that's a very extraordinary thing because I cannot, can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, you know, my mother never talked about what, she, what happened to her. And my black friends who bring their parents, and they say to me, do you know, my parents never talk about apartheid. They went through it, but they don't tell me what it was like. Mm. So I think very often sadness and unhappiness and fear creates a wall that people don't want to actually cross. And the day my father died, I just thought to myself, why didn't I, why didn't I ask him more about his life mm. and about my mother's life? Why it was also about my life and how is it that I know more about Sophia Loren's family than my own family? Wow. So many people have said that after I saw your show, I phoned my granny and I said to my granny, tell me the story of her life. When did you lose her virginity? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and granny told her. <laughs> uh, a lot of familial ruptures happened after watching uh, your play, I'd imagine. Um, but something that's really interesting that was sort of coming to mind as you were talking was, you know, South Africans get criticized sometimes for how much we joke about the things that hurt us about uh, the reality, the lived experience of living in this country. And I wonder if you have a comment on that, you know, because it's, it's, it's thrown back at South Africans to say, well, because sometimes we are uh, so humorous about mm. the, the conditions that we're living in, that it's almost as if we take them light or too lightly. And um, that's not, I don't think that's the case. No, no. Taking, you know, no. To laugh at something that angers you is not something light. Mm. You know, I think it's wonderful that we as a nation, uh, as a community, a national community, can laugh at the appalling things that are happening in our politics. Yeah. And those, those politicians really deserve to be laughed at. The good ones laugh first. <laughs> Nelson Mandela laughed first. That's why I could make fun of him, you know. And he said to me, oh, Pedro, that's very good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, doing it. And I really think that so many of our politicians are pretending to be the royal family. Uh, they, they, they go from one job to another. It doesn't matter what it happens, but they have the lights when we don't have the lights. They hide behind the fact that they are innocent until proved guilty. Well, I think we must change that. Mm. Politicians in our country are now guilty until proved innocent. I think that's a change. Mm -hmm. And that's funny. And it's not funny because it's a joke. It's funny because it's quite serious. Yeah. So I encourage people, don't be scared of making a joke about the things that upset you. My work is based on a definition, 49% anger. 51% entertainment, mm. not the other way around. <laughs> well, you wrote it uh, when you were turning 17. It was supposed to be uh, a show put on for one night only, and since then it's grown uh, leaps and, and bounds, and it's, it's back in Johannesburg at the Monte Cassino uh, Theatre. I wonder if over the years it's sort of morphed into something that you didn't expect. I wonder if if there's something that you've experienced over the last couple of years, putting on uh, the performance that have kind of taken you by surprise. You didn't, you didn't expect uh, to, to, to feel that or to experience that uh, when you first sat down to write The Echo of a Noise. Well, you know, I don't think I ever thought it would last for more than that performance. Mm. And it's an also, it's also an interesting thing. I'm working on a new show that's also going to come here very soon called Sell by Date. <laughs> um, I think my age, I'm 77 now. For most of my life, I was very concerned about what people think. Mm. Really, truly, now the audition is over. The disease to please is cured. I do exactly what I feel is the right thing to do now. If people don't like it, they can go and watch Game of Thrones. It's okay. Don't panic. It's all right. <laughs> it's also given me, given me a liberation yeah. of, uh, you know, I never want to offend people. No, I lie. I want to offend them all the time. I don't want to demean them. Yes. But offending somebody means I'm rat rattling their cage mm -hmm. politically, you know. I'm telling them an alternative to what they believe in, and maybe that is better than what they have as a political um, um, investment. So it's a one being live is a wonderful thing. Being live on stage, seeing you sitting there, your intention on what I'm doing is something so rare because everything at the moment is sort of put in a box. You stream from the cloud mm. that used to be called rain. You know? <laughs> so where do you trace the button to get something? So I say to everybody, bring your kids to my show because there's nothing better than a child, a young person in the car home saying, what did he mean by that, Mommy? Yes. And let Mommy explain a little bit what it means. <laughs> let Mommy get a heart under the color, uh, <laughs> color a little bit there. Um, uh, so fascinating, and, and Peter, I so appreciate um, your time. I, I don't know if it would be a fair question to say, you know, anyone coming to watch the play, do you have any sort of hope 
uh, for what they are to walk away having experienced uh, coming to see you? Do you have a hope? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it's my job to deliver the best every night. Mm. Um, and it is always wonderful to sense the attention and the laughter and the shock. Yeah. Because there are moments that people can actually hear that, <gasps> that moment of like, oh my goodness gracious. But there's always that exhaling. I always say, because we are so angry and so shocked by what happens, we keep on going, <gasps> <gasps> and we got to go, <laughs> but laughter means people go, <sighs> yeah. so it's that wonderful feeling. And I want people to remember it for a long time, and people do. And I remember them as well because my audience become my best friends. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Peter, thank you so much uh, for coming to our studio. That was uh, Peter Dark a prolific writer, uh, performer, joining us in our studios to talk about his production on Edmonton Casino, uh, An Echo of a Noise.